Hi, welcome to the Dr. Joby podcast. This week, I'm simulcasting a lecture on Carl Jung and analytical psychology for a theories of personality course that I'm teaching. I hope you enjoy. I think a good place to begin studying Carl Gustav Jung and his version of um, personality theory called analytical psychology uh, would be with his 1961 autobiography, Memories, Dreams, Reflections. As with all of the theorists that we study, we find um, individual projects of understanding their own selves uh, in then applying that uh, and generalizing that to a greater whole to understand um, the psychology of personality of others. So let's begin with a brief biographical sketch of Jung, uh, some of the highlights of uh, his formative years, his childhood, and um, hopefully that will give us a, some texture to uh, how he came about uh, developing his theory, his analytical psychology. Carl Gustav Jung, also referred to as C.G. Jung, uh, was born in 1875 in a very small village in Switzerland. Uh, Jung's family was strongly Protestant. Um, this is a very Protestant Swiss family. There were no fewer than nine Protestant clergymen in Jung's family. He grew up around, um, around the classics, around uh, the Protestant faith, and um, he was very much attracted to uh, mythology and um, certain, um, a certain mysticism. And uh, Switzerland holds this mysticism. There's a certain ancient, Jung called it uh, a voodoo. There's a certain, there's, there's a lot of witchcraft and voodoo in Switzerland, ancient, ancient uh, times uh, that, are, that are present in the Swiss culture. And um, Jung was, was steeped in this and he was attracted to this. Uh, he was also um, uh, uh, describing in his biography a very tumultuous childhood. Um, parents that seemed to have some uh, neurotic qualities, a lot of argumentation, of, a lot of turmoil in his childhood that probably, uh, as he described, turned his focus inward into his internal uh, fantasy life and his psychical life. And this is a theme that we'll see played a role in, in um, Jung's uh, personality theory and his own uh, spiritual life for the rest of his life. He was a man who privileged the internal world of the psyche. Jung described his father as being um, a kind and tolerant individual, but uh, Jung saw him as a weak individual. He contrastingly saw his mother as very powerful, uh, emotionally uh, unstable, and she could behave rather erratically and tyrannically towards the family. Some other biographers have, have confirmed this, pointing out that Jung's maternal side of the family seemed to have a lot of emotional instability. Jung actually described his mother in his autobiography as fat and unattractive. Jung found refuge in his attic, in the family's attic, and uh, he actually would read there. He uh, would study mythology as a young man, uh, fall into his fantasy life. It was a safe cocoon for him. And he also carved uh, a, a little wooden figure that became his friend that he confided in. Uh, he was an only child until he was nine years old when a sister was born but he doesn't seem to have had a significant relationship with that sister. So we're really seeing here is um, this, an individual who was uh, very much an introvert in his energies, uh, very much someone who found um, solace and, um, and comfort in his, his, uh, his fantasy life and in his own internal world. Not unlike many of the shamanic practices throughout the world, um, Jung began to uh, find guidance in his dreams, and he actually had visions. Now, this can be dismissed as um, through through medicine as uh, as some sort of psychosis, or we can look at it culturally through, as Jung did, through the point of view of um, a rich uh, world cultures of shamanic practices and medicine men. 
uh, and he turned to his dreams and visions as lessons. Uh, he he thought that that he could, that the world or or the essence of some sort of bigger thing in life was channeling through him, and he looked for answers to his problems um, in his fantasies and in his visions and in his dreams. And this really started at a young age, and um, we can see if we start to think about the unconscious. Uh, how Jung would have been um, so taken by the writings of Sigmund Freud in the interpretation of dreams when he first read this book. Suddenly, he had some sort of theoretical basis and even a scientific basis in Freud's new science of the interpretation of dreams to understand his youthful practice of looking to his dreams and his visions for guidance. In Memories, Dreams, and Reflections, uh, Jung talked about a dream that he had when he was three years old, and the dream um, he found himself digging beneath the earth's surface and unearthing bones of prehistoric animals. And um, to Jung, these this uh, was the basis of his idea of how to un, uh, how to explore the human psyche, how to explore what he'd come to call the unconscious mind, digging beneath the surface, and um, we, we see here a great similarity with uh, Freud's ideas of, of the archaeology of the psyche. Jung did not do particularly well in school. He didn't uh, enjoy classroom settings, and uh, he preferred to remain at home on his own and read what he was interested in. He was an individual who, uh, when, he, when he was interested in something, he pursued it uh, like no other would, uh, exclusively and, and passionately and uh, with great rigor, uh, but he didn't care for the uh, the structure of what should be what society thought should be studied, and so uh, he preferred to read on his own. And he read m- much on philosophical, spiritual, ethical, and um, and mythology. Uh, he's reading a great deal of literature and philosophy, spirituality, and mythology. Jung earned a degree in medicine uh, from the University of Basel in Switzerland, and he then um, he then uh, began working at the mental hospital in Zurich, in Switzerland, and uh, and uh, his his director was Eugene Bloiler, who was the psychiatrist who coined the term schizophrenia. But uh, even at this time, in his medical studies. Uh, Jung was interested in dreams, he was interested in the supernatural phenomenon, and he was interested in the occult. And all of these uh, were rooted in experiences he had in his childhood with um, mysticism, with the supernatural, and um, he was very much interested in exploring these as something um, unconscious, something that was uh, mythical and mystical in the essence of being human. After earning his medical degree and working in the, the hospital in Zurich, uh, Jung married uh, one of the wealthy, into one of the wealthiest families in Switzerland, and um, he quit his job and spent his time developing his private practice. And um, this really afforded Jung the ability to pursue his own interests in psychiatry and in developing his theory called analytical psychology. Jung enthusiastically read Freud's Interpretation of Dreams when it was published, and eventually uh, contacting Freud, the the two met in 1907 and had uh, an an epic 13-hour conversation. They immediately had a chemistry. Sigmund Freud was 20 years older than Carl Jung. Uh, They developed what became a very strong friendship and um, even a father-son relationship. And uh, eventually they traveled in 1909 to lecture at Clark University at the invitation of G. Stanley Hall in the United States. And um, this is a rich history between Freud and Jung. Freud had intended Jung to take over uh, the reins, the helm of, uh, of the psychoanalysis, of psychoanalytic project that Freud had started. But uh, Jung was his own individual. And uh, he eventually, in 1912... Uh, published a book of his own that um, contradicted much of 
the basis of Freud's psychoanalysis, but uh, built on on some of Freud's ideas. And uh, this is when uh, Jung developed his idea of analytical psychology, which was distinctly different from psychoanalytic psychology. And um, Freud really uh, did not tolerate any ideas that uh, dissented from his own view of what psychoanalysis should be. And uh, their their friendship ended in 1913 because m- mostly because Jung uh, developed wanted to develop his own ideas, his own theory of personality, his own theory of analytical psychology, and Freud uh, had no room for this in his life. In 1912. Jung published The Psychology of the Unconscious and delivered a paper uh, discussing his ideas, his own individual ideas of the unconscious, which really uh, were quite different than Freud's um, theory of the unconscious. And this was really the uh, publication that uh, severed Freud and Jung's relationship, Jung going on to his own uh, theory of personality and his own notoriety, um, I think that's a great place to begin any study of Jung is with the, the 1912 text. I think a good starting point to describing Jungian theory would be uh, the illustration of Jung's uh, topography of the psyche. Now, if you recall, uh, Freud's idea was that um, we had a conscious, an unconscious, and a preconscious and that in the complete unconscious was the id drives, these uh, drives for sex and hunger and thirst and pleasure, and also a reservoir of uh, wishes. Uh, It was a dark, um, maybe even threatening place, very threatening place, uh, in which the superego also uh, existed out of this in the unconscious, and, um, and the ego's task was to, to, was to manage the desires of the id, the demands of the superego, and function in, within reality. Um, and this was uh, illustrated by Fechner uh, with an iceberg. And um, this is distinctly different from Jung's idea. Jung uh, took his model of the psyche from the Vedic Hindu culture, the Upanishads, and, um, and saw human beings as island chains. If you can imagine looking at the, above the surface of the water and seeing islands and then realizing that those islands go beneath the water into the unconscious, say, and then are connected at a lower base level uh, with one another. And Jung proposed that we do not have um, only unique unconscious experience, but we have collective unconscious experience. So if you can uh, picture a series of islands that uh, are distinctly separate above in consciousness, above the water, and then have unique personal unconscious beneath the surface of the water, but then at an even deeper level are connected and share what is called a collective unconscious. Now, for Jung, the collective unconscious was our ancestral evolutionary spatial past. There are all the uh, memories uh, and emotions and feelings and experiences that, we, uh, that we've had through our evolutionary history, very much affected by uh, Lamarckian uh, d- uh, evolution theory. Um, a theory today that says that we can actually transmit the memories and emotions of our ancestors through our genes. Uh, This is very similar to Jung's idea of a collective unconscious. The collective unconscious is not merely a collection of our ancestral past, of our personal ancestors, but it's a universal, special human ancestral past. Jung felt that we didn't directly inherit phobias or fears or or uh, specific um, directed things, but rather predispositions towards. So, for instance, we, we wouldn't inherit um, collectively a fear of snakes, but inherit a potential for um, the universal fear of snakes. The collective unconscious uh, was a force. It shaped human personality. And uh, depending on an individual's personal experiences as they were growing up, uh, which were part of what we will describe as Jung's personal unconscious, 
Uh, these are personal life experiences, personal predispositions that are not universal to the entire human species. And um, these interact, of course, then with the ego to manifest in, um, in the dynamic of personality. So for Jung, we have this dynamic interaction between the collective unconscious, that thing that makes us all psychically human, the personal unconscious, which is our personal history of emotions and behaviors and experiences, uh, and then our ego, which is the self. It's the, the, the me that I know. Some of these emotional unconscious, collective unconscious experiences are things like um, terror of the dark, um, also ideas of um, some sort of like a godlike figure, um, the idea of uh, an evil being, a fearful fearfulness of evil, this, this concept maybe of evil, and also things like life and death. These are all for Jung um, specially embedded in our ancestral experience and are part of our human collective unconscious. Jung described this relationship between reality, the consciousness, the ego, um, the personal unconscious, and the collective unconscious in, in this way. Um, he felt that ancestrally we are born with a certain predisposition towards our mother. Uh, depending then on how the mother interacts in reality with the individual, um, that um, experience will uh, manifest itself between the un collective unconscious predisposition of expectations of motherness and the uh, personal unconscious, which is the experience of the actual experience of the mother. And somehow between the dynamic of what our ancestral collective unconscious uh, is predisposed to expect, and what uh, happens in reality comes to form our, our personal unconscious, which contributes a great deal to our personality. It also clearly illustrates how our personality is simultaneously dependent on collective unconscious and personal unconscious. Jung described um, a certain universal human um, experience of patterns uh, that become embedded in the collective unconscious. These are certain concepts or of experiences, concepts of experiences. And he referred to these as primordial images, and he later called them archetypes. And archetypes are these, these universal human experiences that we all share regardless of culture, regardless of time, period. So regardless of place or time, we all share these, the knowledge of these uh, archetypes. And this knowledge isn't born into us. It's born into us from our ancestral past, into our genetics, we can say. And some of these archetypes are ideas like um, the mother or motherness. Um, father and fatherness, the hero, uh, the child, God, death, power, the wise old man. Now it's often illustrated um, in looking to literature and film and seeing the archetypes that exist in, um, in stories and narratives. So for example, if we look at a film, we, we might consider a coming of age film and in the coming-of-age film, there's the archetype of the young person that's uh, making the transition from uh, ch childhood to adulthood. Uh, we also have different characters, uh, like maybe a, a certain punitive male individual that would be an archetype, uh, and then uh, maybe a, 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 a wise person, a wise old woman or a wise old man, that as soon as we look at them, we know that archetype. We don't even need to have their character completely fleshed out. We somehow inherently know this, this archetype of this person. So these are, the archetypes are these patterned experiences that are, that are embedded in our ancestral past that we all carry with us as a priori knowledge. This is a knowledge of an essence that exists in us from birth. For Jung, there were five archetypes in particular that were very central to personality. 
And um, I'll begin by describing um, one of these archetypes, which is the self archetype. The self archetype for Jung was the integration of all of the aspects. It's the concept of the integration of the, all of the aspects of the psyche, the ego, the personal unconscious, the collective unconscious, the knowledge of this um, unity uh, is what is understood as the self, and it's an archetype. The self, the, the concept of self for Jung is something that is universally uh, understood from our ancestral past. The self is different from the persona. The persona is the mask. The persona is an archetype. It's an understanding of the social self that we put on in any given situation. Uh, so it would be like the social self. Um, so we have the, the self, which is our authentic integration of all of the aspects of who we are. And then we have the persona, which is our kind of performance that we give in specific times with specific people. And this might be um, in, in younger years, sometimes we struggle to understand how we, are, we have one persona in one situation and another persona in another situation as we get older. Uh, these are uh, transcended and enveloped into a larger sense of integration, which Jung said is the self. So an individual can actually become um, uh, wrapped up in the persona, buy into the persona, uh, can actually um, b become a part of their, the, the, the self can be overshadowed by the by the persona, and this would be a, a neurotic type of person. This is a person who bought into their own PR story. So this is the individual who is actually alienated from their, them, their true self and uh, has become centralized around their persona, around their mask. As we'll see, one of the steps, even the first step in uh, working towards integrating the whole self a process that um, Jung refers to as individuation, is dethroning the persona. Dethroning the persona is becoming aware of our persona, our personae, our personas, and dethroning them, not rejecting them, but allowing them the, in their multiplicity to be part of the self. Jung also described the two archetypes of the animus and the anima, and these are feminine and masculine um, aspects of the psyche. The anima would re represent femininity and the animus masculinity. So um, essentially, uh, Jung saw our, us characteristically as bisexual. Of course, the ideas, most of the ideas of masculinity and femininity are very culturally determined. Uh, but these are certain manifest characteristics and temperaments and attitudes that seem to be present in uh, each sex. And this, uh, Jung, instead of seeing possibly uh, masculine or feminine, he saw bisexual individuals that manifested either masculinity or femininity uh, to a certain degree. But masculinity and femininity, or animus and anima, were part of all of us. We all have this diametrically opposed uh, being. And he, he showed this in the yin-yang symbols where um, we have the black with a tiny white dot, which would be the anima with a tiny bit of animus, and the, the white swirl with the little black eye, which is the, uh, the animus with a little touch of anima in it. So for all of us, we have masculine and feminine aspects of ourselves that are predominant in, in our being. Uh, we'll find that uh, Jung found that integration meant uh, accepting the anima in the animus and accepting the animus in the anima. And as we got older, uh, Jung said we, we become more androgynous. The, the animus and the anima balance out, and we see men, as they age, becoming softer, more gentle, more feminine and even in their, their physical characteristics, and we see women uh, balancing out and becoming m m maybe m m some more powerful, more leaders, more, um, more s s solid in some ways. Um, and again, these are difficult terms to wrestle with because we are using you know, early 20th century uh, ideas of masculinity and femininity, which are still apparent 
to today. Um, they're still relevant today, um, but we, uh, the contemporary Jungian scholars, um, take up this issue of how we culturally define the masculine and feminine traits. But these are the two aspects of the animus archetype and the anima archetype, our archetypal understanding of masculine and feminine. Finally, the major archetype that Jung talked about that, we, uh, that is predominant in our personality is the idea of the shadow. And I like to understand the shadow as being similar to, to Freud's id, uh, the shadow is the dark side of us. It's the, the, the thing that contains our primitive animal instincts. It's all of those things that, where evil and immorality uh, reside, all of these dangerous things that, um, that our ego defense to, uh, protects us against. It's these aspects of ourselves that are the potential for us all. We're all potentially thieves and robbers and rapists and etc., um, we all have the potential of this. This is the shadow side of us. And Jung felt, as we will see, that when this becomes integrated into ourselves, when we face the, uh, the evil within us, it unleashes a beautiful source of vitality and spontaneity, creativity and emotion. And so this is not something that we should hide from ourselves or bury from ourselves. It's something that we should come into contact with. And in so doing, in so acknowledging this aspect, the shadow in ourselves, it frees us from having to, to defend against it. We accept that it's there, we acknowledge that it's there, and it becomes a wellspring of creative and spontaneous life. So this is an idea of the, the structure of the collective unconscious and the topic, uh, the topology of the psyche as being like island chains, a conscious uh, where the ego resides, um, a collective unconscious at the deepest level, and then our personal experiences, which we'll discuss next in the personal unconscious. Hi, welcome to the Dr. Joby podcast. This is lecture three, part two, Carl Gustav Jung's theory of personality. I understand Jung's concept of ego not as existing in consciousness, but as consciousness itself. The ego is the thinking, the feeling, the remembering, the perceiving. It's the gatekeeper that admits into our awareness um, only certain aspects of the stimuli in which we come into contact with. Uh, it is our truth um, in which we come into contact with reality, with, with whatever stimulus is out there. But of course, it's our ego that shapes and determines how we experience that reality. So primarily, what is important for Jung is not what is, but what we see. In other words, what we perceive becomes reality to us. Drawing on Eastern philosophy, Buddhism, and the Vedic Hindu tradition, uh, Jung saw that the self was comprised of binary oppositions, dichotomies. And um, the first of the, the two most basic uh, of the attitudes of the ego, uh, he said that we exist in different circumstances in a continuum between extroversion and introversion. Um, the extrovert is someone who puts forth their energies outside of themselves, who focuses their energies on external, on the external world. And an introvert is one who focuses their psychic energies on their internal thoughts, their, their internal world. And he said that we all have um, an extroverted and an introverted uh, aspect of our ego, of our self, um, but we, that we shift through and depend on, depending on the uh, the circumstances and the environment that we're in, but we do have a primary uh, attitude, a primary tendency of being at the basis of our personality, mostly extroverted or mostly introverted. Now, again, we don't want to think of extroversion and introversion as outgoing and shy. This is not so much about shyness and outgoingness. This is more about where one places their psychic energy. That psychical energy, that's that psychic energy that he's discussing is 
what uh, Freud called libido, libidinal psychic energy. So our, the basic uh, attitude of, of our ego, of ourselves, is one that is either predominantly extroverted or introverted, outwardly focused or inwardly focused. Jung felt that we could understand how an extroverted individual or an introverted individual came into contact with uh, either the internal world of the introvert or the external world of the extrovert. So an introvert would be focused on the internal world, but also aware of the external world. And an extrovert would be focused on the external world, but aware of their internal emotional fantasy world. And Jung proposed that there were four basic functions of an extrovert or an introvert, four ways in which the introvert comes into contact with their internal world, four ways in which an extrovert comes into contact with their extroverted world. And these four ways are broken into two categories. These two categories are either a rational function or a non-rational function. The rational function. Rational individuals come into contact with the external or the internal world through either thinking or through feeling. And these are individuals who um, typically experience the world in a judgmental way. They judge the world as either being good or bad, uh, liking or disliking, true or false. So an individual can be either introverted or extroverted. That means they're either focused in their being in the external world or in their internal world. And they can either be rational or non-rational. And if they are rational, they typically are either a thinking individual or a feeling individual. So you can have an introverted thinking type or an introverted feeling type. We're going to go in specifically to what each of these types of personalities look like. Um, but first, let's also explore the non-rational uh, f uh, functions of the psyche. A non-rational function of the psyche is not judgmental. They're not uh, individuals who are interested in true or false, like or dislike, and making judgments. It's non-judgmental. It's more experiential. And these individuals are either sensing relying on the five senses, on sensory experience, or on intuiting, on intuition, on what we might call the gut feeling. These are not uh, right or wrong, true or false. These are more uh, senses of, um, of non-judgment. So we can have um, a non-rational person who is either predominantly sensing or intuiting, so in other words, we all have our gut instincts, and we all have our sensory pleasures, our, our enjoyment of the senses, but some of us are more inclined to trust our intuition, others are more directed to our senses, and we also have the ability to think and the ability to feel, but some of us are more uh, reliant on the psychological function of thinking and others are more reliant on the psychological function of feeling. So what we end up it is, with is eight psychological types. And these eight psychological types would be an extroverted thinker or an introverted thinker, an extroverted feeler or an introverted feeler, an extroverted intuiting type or an introverted intuiting type, and, or an extroverted sensing type or an introverted sensing type. So if you remember, to remember these, there are the extrovert predominantly or the introvert at the basis of personality. And then one of four qualities will be predominant, either thinking or feeling or intuiting or sensing. And please keep in mind that Jung felt that we all of these functions and attitudes were present in all of us, but some or predominant in our personality structures. So let's take a closer look at these eight psychological types. Um, let's begin by looking at the uh, extroverted types, uh, the extroverted thinking type. Now, when, Jung, when one goes to a Jungian analysis, 
uh, a Jungian analyst and has a Jungian analysis done, um, the eight psychological types uh, are are the basic for basis for that analysis. So one will be through analysis. One will be um, told if they're an extroverted thinking type or uh, extroverted feeling type or extroverted intuitive type or the extroverted sensing type. So let's look at these these four personality types first, the extroverted type. So the first type would be extroverted thinking type. So this is someone who is outwardly focused, an action-oriented individual, and also is focused on thinking. Um, these individuals tend to make good scientists, uh, and they're often perceived as being um, very rigid and uh, cold, uh, dogmatic in their thoughts and opinions. Uh, they tend to privilege thinking over the feelings or their emotions, and they prize and privilege objectivity in all aspects of life. So if you can think of an extroverted thinking type, this is an individual who um, really ascribes to the world of logic and rules. Um, if you can think of someone in your life that this uh, fits the bill for describing their personality, this is an individual who is interested in the objective truth and in what's true, what's real, uh, is somewhat rigid and dogmatic in these in these opinions, and uh, uh, base their their opinions on, on more empirical, uh, objective methods. Uh, so these folks, the extroverted thinking types, are what we typically see drawn to professions such as scientists. An example from popular culture might be Judge Judy. Judge Judy is an extroverted thinking type. She sticks to the objective thoughts and f facts, and she is not uh, so interested in feelings or emotions. So um, that is the extroverted thinking type of personality for Carl Jung. We turn now to the extroverted feeling type. The extroverted feeling type is someone who uh, is focusing their energies outwardly. They're extroverted. Uh, but they are primarily interested in emotional experiences, in their feelings. This is what informs them about the world. They tend, according to Jung, to uh, cling to traditional values. They're more conservative in their values. Uh, they are also able to make friends very easily. They're emotionally responsive. They're sociable. Um, they're very uh, sensitive to the opinion and expectation of others. And perhaps uh, this is an individual from popular culture that we could uh, see as someone such as Elton John or Oprah Winfrey. These are individuals that are uh, outwardly, socially very warm, very easily approachable. They are also very um, sensitive to the opinions of others and um, tend to be primarily informed of the world through how they feel, through their emotions. Extroverted sensing types are not only outwardly focused, but they're very uh, in tune and aware of their sensory experiences. These individuals make um, very good dancers, uh, professional dancers, ballet dancers, and da modern dancers. Uh, these are individuals who are very engaged in, their, um, in the physical world. They enjoy pleasure and happiness uh, through their senses, well, the way uh, the sensory experience occurs. Uh, these are individuals who are adaptable to different kinds of people and changing situations, and they tend to be outgoing uh, and enjoy the physical aspects of life. Uh, an example of, of an extroverted sensing type person could be possibly Bill Clinton, the extroverted intuitive type is someone who is externally, outwardly focused with their energies. They're outgoing, uh, but they are also very aware of their intuitive, their intuitive sense, their gut feelings. Uh, these are individuals who typically are good in politics and are good in business. They're great at identifying and exploiting opportunities. They may even be considered to be opportunistic in many ways. Um, these are individuals that are attracted to new ideas. They're creative. They also tend to inspire others to have great achievements. And uh, 
they are very um, uh, changeable. They often move from one venture to another, uh, and they make decisions based on their, their gut hunches. Uh, an individual in the popular, in popular individual might be Ellen DeGeneres, who would be an extroverted, intuiting type. And now those are the four extroverted personality types, the extroverted thinking type, extroverted feeling type, extroverted sensing type, and the extroverted intuiting type. Let's turn now to the introverted uh, types. The introverted thinking type um, is someone who doesn't get along so well with others, and uh, they have difficulty communicating ideas. These individuals are often focused on their thoughts uh, rather than on their feelings, and they don't have very good practical judgment. They are very concerned about keeping their lives private. They're concerned with privacy, and they prefer to deal with abstractions and theories rather than uh, facts. Sometimes they come off as being arrogant or inconsiderate or even aloof. And this might be an individual in a popular sense like Albert Einstein. So this is an introverted individual who thinks. The introverted feeling type is uh, someone who represses rational thought. And these are individuals who are very moved by deep emotions, uh, but they um, avoid outwardly displaying that emotion. So their introverted tendency keeps them from a demonstrative uh, being in expressing their emotion, but they have a deep feeling of the emotion. They often appear modest, uh, they even childish in a certain way, uh, and they can be seen as being withdrawn, uh, cold, maybe self-assured. And in a popular uh, light, uh, we could think of people like Michael Jackson or John Lennon uh, both of these individuals uh, were introverted feeling types. An introverted intuitive type. This is an individual who focuses on their internal world and trusts their gut feelings. They trust their intuition. They privilege intuition over evidence. Uh, intro introverted intuiting types are often uh, seen as visionaries, and uh, they're not so interested in what uh, external reality is, but they're interested in the internal reality, uh, the intuitive reality. These are often people who are seen as uh, aloof and unconcerned with practical matters. Uh, they're visionaries, they're daydreamers, and they're often uh, misunderstood by others. Uh, Carl Jung called himself an introverted intuitive type. Uh, I like to think of someone such as Steve Jobs. I think Steve Jobs was probably an intuitive, um, introverted type, he, although he could have had very strong uh, thinking aspects, but he was an innovator. And your professor uh, is an introverted, intuitive type. And finally, we have the uh, introverted sensing type. The introverted sensing type uh, is someone who's typically passive and calm. They seem detached. Uh, they're aesthetically sensitive, and um, they also tend to um, be s express themselves in art or music and uh, often repress their intuition. Uh, so these are often artists, and we, we see the in introverted sensing type in people such as Tiger Woods um, and, uh, and Sean Connery, the actor. Uh, so these are the four basic personality types that are introverted. The introverted thinking type, introverted feeling type, introverted intuiting type, and the introverted sensing type. If you're interested in taking a test online to get an idea of your own personality type, um, you can explore the Myers-Briggs type indicator. And there are online some uh, fun ones to take. Uh, I wouldn't tr trust them to be valid or reliable, but it'll give you a pretty good idea. And uh, at least in my experience, um, they have been accurate. The one that I'm including a link to um, in the in the sidebar here, you will you'll you'll see is a, an online version of the Myers Briggs Type Indicator. The real Myers Briggs, you'd have to go to a professional to take. Um, but uh, this one online, uh, for me at least, it was very, very um, accurate. Uh, the Myers-Briggs type indicator, the MBTI, 
will tell you your basic introverted and extroverted thinking, feeling, intuiting, or sensing type. And it also gives a few other, um, a few added uh, dimensions to this re uh, based on um, th feeling and judging at, and thinking. Uh, so you, you want to look at those letters and then you'll be able to find a key or look into the whether or not you, you are the extroverted or introverted and thinking, feeling, intuiting, or sensing type, and then just look back to Jung's description. Uh, so that's the Myers-Briggs type indicator, and you usually see this indicated by four letters uh, that uh, describe the personality type. So we have looked at the ego, its attitudes, its functions, and uh, we in previously had looked at the collective unconscious and the archetypes, the primor uh, primordial images. And um, finally, for this section of our lecture, let's have a little discussion of the personal unconscious. Again, the personal unconscious is our own individual unconscious, the uh, reservoir of our own uh, experiences and memories and emotions and things that are suppressed and repressed. And um, in the personal unconscious, uh, these are things that influence us in our behavior presently and uh, also things that have happened in the past. So this is how our personal past influences our personal present. Um, are the, there are certain patterns of emotional emotions and memories and perceptions and wishes that are typically unconscious to us, but they can be made conscious. And Jung referred to these as complexes. And um, there's patterns of emotions, there's patterns of perceptions, patterns of memories, patterns of wishes that are unique to each of us. And um, the complex is focused around some orientation. And the orientation is the thing which we are guided towards. So for Jung, um, an orientation or a complex could be power. So some individuals, uh, their collective, un I'm sorry, their personal unconscious is organized around a complex of power. What they're interested in achieving in any endeavor that they take place in is uh, power or perfection. Uh, we can have uh, a personal unconscious, we can have a complex of, of kindness or helpfulness, rescuer, things of this nature. So a complex is whatever that thing is that uh, all our memories, um, our perceptions, and our emotions uh, are patterned around. It's a central theme. And going through a, a Jungian analysis, you would actually come to discover uh, complexes, what that orienting complex is in your life. So the process of a Jungian analysis is very interesting in itself with the, the goal of transcendence and individuation. And we're going to be talking about that in part three of lecture three. Hi, this is Dr. Joby. Welcome to the podcast. This is part three of lecture three on Carl Jung's theory of personality. Concluding our introduction to Carl Gustav Jung's theory of analytical psychology, uh, I would like to explore some concepts that um, are rather interesting uh, and definitely essential to Carl Jung. Uh, typically, when I introduce Jung to, uh, to anyone, I ask them to first read the introduction, the foreword rather, to the Chinese Book of Changes, the I Ching, and I'm providing that link for you. Um, this, to me, is a great example of Jung's uh, approach to, um, to life, to living, and to his, uh, his form of psychotherapy, which is analytical psychology. Uh, Jung often used the ancient Chinese book of changes, the I Ching, uh, to, as a form of, um, of psychotherapy with his patients and, in, and guiding light in his own life. And um, to use this book is to understand some of the major concepts of psychoanalysis in Jung. Now, in helping you to understand the connection between the, the, um, the I Ching, the Chinese Book of Changes, and Jung's theory, you have to understand that in order to become a Jungian analyst, one must become an expert in an ancient mythology. After the traditional uh, training in psycho, becoming a psychoanalyst, uh, one spends a year 
learning in depth in ancient mythology. This could be native indigenous people from anywhere in the world. It could be Buddhism, Hinduism, um, Greek mythology, uh, Lenape uh, th mythology. Uh, but one becomes an expert in ancient mythology. In um, Jung's case, Buddhism was quite, and, and Hinduism, Vedic culture, was quite influential. Um, as we had learned before, hit the model for his uh, theory of personality of the uh, unconscious, the collective unconscious, the personal unconscious, and the ego comes from Vedic, um, Vedic religion. Um, when we look at the I Ching, we understand at least two of the concepts that Jung uh, proposed in his theory of personality. Firstly, he proposed that the internal world is much more important than the external world. And the I Ching becomes, the Book of Changes, becomes a certain sort of projective test of Rorschach. It's a way for us to dislodge ourselves from usual thinking and to use words, not unlike poetry, to project our unconscious onto. So when we roll the coins or when we throw the straws and we read the uh, random text that is delivered to us through the I Ching to consult whatever life issue we're looking at, uh, Jung proposed that we actually project ourselves onto these words. We're reading our unconscious. Um, so the I Ching is used as a sort of projective test. And Jung actually used this with his patients. He um, used it to direct his own life. And uh, even though there is a, a strong mystical side to this, the mysticism is not really one of out there. The mysticism is one of in here. It's, it's Jung's idea that our unconscious is the wellspring of life, the wellspring of creativity. Um, this brings us to the idea of synchronicity. Uh, this is another concept that is central to Jung's thinking, and uh, I've provided a link to uh, read more about synchronicity. Jung believed there were no, th there were very few uh, mistakes in life. Uh, so things that were chance happenings that had great impact on our lives, uh, Jung refers to as synchronicity. This is the concept of synchronicity. It's the idea that our collective unconscious, uh, these psychic energies that we all have in us, um, w create some sort of dynamic, a cosmic dynamic in which things that seem to occur by chance are actually highly meaningful. And to explore those um, are, is an opportunity to explore our very own unconscious, our own personal unconscious, and in the context of our collective unconscious. So the concept of synchronicity, uh, where as objective, traditional, experimental science uh, that relies on statistics would dismiss uh, probable chances, uh, occurrences, um, Jung felt that things that happened that were meaningful were meaningful, regardless of uh, how unlikely they were. And this is what he referred to as synchronicity. And he wrote an entire book on this. And uh, I have included a link to that as well for your optional interest. Uh, so we have projection, we have synchronicity. And there's another term that I'd really like you to be familiar with, and that's the idea of a Weltanschauung. And the Weltanschauung, I've uh, re uh, included the link to um, to reading about the Weltanschauung as well. Um, and this is the German term for worldview. And the Weltanschauung, Weltanschauung is our particular space from which we look. It's our unique collective and personal unconscious and how that comes to shape the world that we see. So for Jung, we each have a Weltanschauung, we each have a worldview. And these worldviews can overlap, they can be similar to others, Weltanschauung, they can be uh, different to other Weltanschauungen. And we look at these, and um, the, more, the better we understand our own Weltanschauung, the better we understand ourselves. So for Jung, these concepts, synchronicity, uh, the, the projection through the Jing, the seeing of the unconscious, and the Weltanschauung are essential to understanding Jungian theory of personality. What we have here is not just a personality theory. We have a, a philosophy of life. It's a life philosophy. It's a practical life philosophy. Now, I've spoken about the wellspring, the unconscious as the wellspring of life, of creativity, of vitality. And uh, this is uh, a concept that um, Jung really develops through alchemy. Jung wrote no fewer than 
three uh, very thick volumes on alchemy, and in other area, other uh, collected writings, alchemy is is discussed quite a bit. Um, and if I can remind you, alchemy is the ancient um, practice of trying to turn base metals into gold. Jung was not interested in turning base metals into gold. Uh, Jung proposed that the entire project of alchemy was a metaphor, uh, that alchemy itself, the idea of turning uh, base metals such as lead and silver and bronze into gold, uh, was not the, the real pursuit of alchemy. Uh, the, this was a metaphor for um, Plato's idea of there being three basic personality types, uh, the bronze person who lives from their desires, their stomach, Plato said that we live. That people who live from their the bronze personality type lives from their gut, from their stomach, their hunger, their desire. This would be like the Freudian id. Um, and the person who is a silver personality is uh, living from a sense of their chest, from pride and dignity and uh, pursuit of fame and things of this nature, notoriety, power. And then um, Plato described the gold individual, the philosopher king. This is an individual who lived from their mind, from their head. And um, for Jung, he saw the entire project of alchemy not as being one that was since that was literally trying to change metals uh, into gold, base metals into gold, but was a, a theory of transformation of, of personality, of psychotherapy, turning uh, base uh, personalities into gold philosopher kings. And this is a tradition called hermetic or hermeneutic Hermetic alchemy, um, and this is using the principles of the alchemic texts as a form of psychotherapy, and this is exactly what Jung pursued. Um, the wellspring of life, the, the uh, philosopher's stone and the, the well in which life springs from, for Jung was the unconscious, and he made the majority of his career uh, researching the ancient alchemical texts, the ancient writings of alchemy, and viewing them not as literally... Uh, metal transformations of metal, but transformations of the human psyche, of the human soul. One could devote their entire professional career to just investigating this area of Jung's work, the work on alchemy. I'm going to include a, a link to get you started if you're interested in this. Um, so this idea of, uh, these are just some of the basic ideas of Weltanschauung, synchronicity, the uh, unconscious as the wellspring of life through the I Ching and, uh, and hermeneutic alchemy. Um, these are all things to look into uh, when thinking about Carl Jung. Now, some of these concepts, the alchemical concepts um, that were applied to the human soul have to do with psychic energies. If you remember that Freud proposed a very broad term of libido, which was a life energy, and um, it began as a more narrow, in Freud's work, it began as a more narrow idea of sexual energy and expanded later in his writings to a very broad kind of life energy. And Jung, for Jung, it was a very broad life energy. And this psychic energy for Jung, this, um, this emotional combustion, was the thing that drove the personality. And uh, Jung um, described that there were uh, three basic ways in which this uh, libidinal energy interacted. And he called these uh, these three principles the opposition principle, the equivalence principle, and the entropy principle. And to give you an idea, um, the, uh, Jung felt that the libidinal uh, system was a closed system and that energies that were concentrated from uh, one particular a psychic pursuit could be transferred to another, and when one concentrates their energies in one area, it takes from energies in other areas of their life. So the idea of the opposition principle, and it's um, it's uh, the existence of uh, opposites, um, and the idea that uh, they're they're like heat versus cold, height versus uh, depth, um, creation versus decay, and he felt that. The opposition is the conflict between these polarities, um, that these two opposing processes not only uh, are uh, necessary for their own identity. So in other words, 
in order to have um, a, a, an interpersonal uh, concentration of warmth, one must also have coldness or distance or aloofness, that these oppositions play on each other and one psychic energy can be placed in the other and they mutually coexist and are mutually codependent on each other for existence. So um, these oppositions are the things that create the psychic energy, good, bad, uh, love, hate, things of this nature. So this is the, the, the uh, principle of opposition. Uh, the principle of equivalence of psychic events um, has to do with um, uh, the psychic value uh, of a particular area that, that weakens when it's concentrated in one area. So it's a redistribution of energy within personality. When one focuses their pursuits of energy on one area, the energy is concentrated psychically in that area and taken away from other areas. We might understand this even in our interaction with uh, media or with other individuals when we're in friendships or even our relationship with ourselves. When we're focusing on one person, our psychic energies go even in our dreams, in our life, in our emotional content to that individual, and they're taken from another individual. Uh, individuals who go internally, who look within themselves, who meditate, are intentionally shifting the focus from others and the outside world into themselves. And this is the idea of uh, equivalence, the principle of equivalence. It's the ability to shift energies and the idea that it's a closed system. Um, the, the third concept that Jung spoke about was the entropy principle. And this is a tendency towards a balance or an equilibri equilibrium within the psyche. Now, if you recall that um, we had the animus and the anima, these oppositions, and over time, uh, over aging, these, these two, the masculine and the feminine energies, balance out. They become more even, whereas in earlier in life, they could be concentrated more towards the masculine and the feminine. So this is entropy principle is the idea that our psychic energy goes through uh, a series of changes over life that ends in ultimately in a balance. Now, not only life um, is a form of, of forging these energies into balance, but uh, analytical psychology is as well, going into uh, analysis, a Jungian analysis. And um, the idea, the, the, the goal of, of analysis is individuation. And individuation is an integration of all aspects of the self. It's a spontaneous flow of the unconscious, and it's an acceptance of all of the archetypes of the self, uh, an acceptance of the different personae that we carry, uh, integrate it with the authentic self, with this dark side of us, the shadow. Um, and Jung said that this, uh, this process of individuation not only takes place throughout the life cycle, but also through, um, psycho, through analytical psychotherapy. Um, the ultimate goal is transcendence, and that's um, the, the, the innate uh, tendency towards individuation. Um, now, before I describe this in sp specifically, uh, there's a film by Federico Fellini called Eight and a Half, Otto e Mezzo. It's an Italian film. And this is a film that uh, Fellini uh, wrote while undergoing a Jungian analysis. And uh, this is a film that if you have the time to watch uh, and uh, you want to take the time to learn more about Jung, it might be valuable for you to, to watch this film. And you'll notice uh, that the film itself goes through the process of dethroning the persona, the first step. Uh, this is uh, understanding the genuine self versus the, the persona that we put out for others. Uh, the second stage that you'll find uh, themes of in this film is uh, acceptance of our shadow. Uh, that means accepting the dark side of our ourselves. The, and third, the the balancing of the animus and the anima, uh, the the embracing of the opposite of which we concentrate our, our self sense of self on, and finally transcendence, which is the 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 integration of all aspects of the self, which uh, is actually the grand finale of the film Eight and a Half. When you watch this, you'll see an integration of all the archetypes, all of the the different people, the persona, uh, the self, the shadow. Um, and Fellini did an absolutely incredible job at expressing the entire process of Jungian uh, therapy, uh, Jungian analysis, rather, in, uh, in the film Eight and a Half. So it's well worth checking out. And uh, it's a film that you can revisit over and over again in your life. Now, here's the interesting thing about 
um, not only uh, Fellini in the film Eight and a Half, but Jung. Jung believed that our personality development uh, really started, let me say, it kicked in at least. It started at birth, but it really kicks in around the age of 40. Jung uh, likened the life stages to being like a rising sun uh, in the first half of life, and then high noon, which is the midlife, and then the sunset, which is the, the last part of life. And um, he, this would be equal to like childhood, adulthood, um, middle age, and then uh, old age. And uh, Jung said that at the first half of life, this is from high sun to from sunrise to the high sun, that there were a group of rules that we played for, uh, played by, and those rules were one of taking, one of accumulating, one of gaining, gaining uh, education, uh, taking you know, gaining resources, money, establishing oneself. And then he said at the, around the age of 40, in the midlife, at the high sun, uh, at the 12 noon of life, uh, we begin to have a transformation where we look into ourselves. We become more introspective. And we become more interested in what we can do for future generations. The rules of the first half of life are take. The rules of the second half of life are give. Uh, Jung said that we, this is around the time when people begin to become more spiritual, they become, they pursue arts and things like painting and, and pottery making and uh, reading mythology and religion, etc. And uh, there's a transformation that takes the midlife. Jung said individuals who at the midlife still cling on to the rules of the first half of life uh, are in crisis. And this is what he coined the term midlife crisis. And this is an individual who is in their second half of life trying to play by the rules of the first half of life. And so we see individuals who are doing things to try to cling on to youth. Jung said that this is something that has to be given up, come into contact with, and in the second half of life, individuals uh, should play by the rules of the second half of life. That is, what can I do for others? What can I do for future generations? Uh, a turn towards spirituality and generativity. Um, Jung uh, said that part of the midlife crisis, of course, was accepting that the rules of the game change at this point in life. So for, if you remember for Freud, the first five years were the most important uh, building blocks of personality. For Carl Jung, midlife becomes the most important part. Carl Jung felt that, uh, and one of his famous quotes is that um, we're only practicing uh, and, and up until the age of 40, and then we really start doing our, our personality growth after the age of 40. So this is, uh, can be found in, in Jung's writings on the development of the psyche, development of personality. And uh, it's the sunrise, high noon, sunset model. And it really uh, shows us these three aspects of life, uh, youth, uh, mid middle age, and old age. Finally, the relationship between Carl Gustav Jung and Sigmund Freud is significant in the history of psychodynamic theory and psychodynamic thought. Um, there's a, an incredible uh, book that was written by John Kerr called A Most Dangerous Method, and I'll provide a link to that book, and it was made into a film as well called uh, A Dangerous Method, and this is a a uh, uh, the story of of the relationship between Sigmund Freud and Carl Jung, and I think that it's a, a very useful uh, read or watch for you to understand the the relationship uh, between Freud and Jung, and how that relationship went on to shape each of their own uh, theories of personality.